and uh, then we're going to pray together, and we're going to get into this. First John, chapter three, beginning to read, verse one. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called the children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he, Jesus, is pure. Let's pray pray together. Heavenly Father, we bow our hearts before you right now. Lord, we are indebted to you. And yet, Lord, we owe a debt we could never pay. You bridged the great divide, the chasm that separated us from you. You crossed that great divide by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, that we might receive new life, that we may be made new creations, that we may receive eternal life. And Lord, in the amazing power and glory, Lord, of choosing to send your son to die on a cross, a Roman cross, a primitive, bloody form of execution. And yet the grave could not hold you. The grave could not hold Jesus, and you raised your son from the dead. And Lord, today, we want to pray that as your church, Lord, we would acknowledge the, the glory of that and that we would walk in the power of that. Lord, we know there is the historical fact of the resurrection. And we also know, Lord, there is the practical application, so many practical applications, one of which, Lord, is that we are able to walk now in newness of life. And today we want to lift up that concept, Lord. As we're going to see in pretty much all the verses that we cover today, <clears throat> you've called us to walk in that resurrection life. You've enabled us, you've empowered us to do it. And today, Lord, I pray that that would shine forth as we look into your word, as we study your word. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would please glorify yourself today through the proclamation of your word. And bring wisdom to our hearts, God, And help us to see exactly what the text wants us to see today, Lord. Thank you for your spirit who guides us into all truth. And we lift this all up to you, Lord. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our King, our our resurrected King. In his name we pray, amen, amen. Well, we're going back to verse 3. This first section of chapter 3 concludes, and everyone who has this hope that we talked about last week, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him, purifies himself just as he is pure. So the main point here is knowing our future, knowing what awaits us, this should motivate our present. Knowing our future should motivate us in the present. The hope of Christ's return makes a practical difference in the lifestyle 
and behavior of believers. When this hope is fixed on him, it produces, or at least should produce, a growing desire to be like him, to be like Christ now. Our hope is the hope, obviously, of ultimate salvation, of eternal sonship, of glorification that we saw last week from Romans chapter 8. Our hope is in Christ alone, who sits at the right hand of God the Father, having been raised from the dead. And what that means is, is that our hope has a secure foundation because it is anchored not in the temporal, but as it is anchored in Jesus Christ himself. And our text here is indicating that hope fixed upon Jesus purifies. That's the word there. It purifies. And that word is a term denoting moral purification. Since Christ is pure, a hope that is fixed on him cannot but have a purifying effect. Do we have the hope of one day being conformed to the image of Christ? One day in perfection, having no, no longer having a body of sin, a body that's weighed down with the effects of sin? Well, the fact of the matter is, if that's the case, we're going to strive for perfection now. We're going to strive for purity now. One writer said, the Christian, though he sees much filthiness in his spirit for the present, yet he labors to purge himself and is ashamed of his hardness of heart and unbelief. Or to state the opposite, he who stops purifying himself has dropped this hope from his heart. If we know the God who is pure and we are in his family, then we will strive for purity ourselves. This is not a command, meaning that the word here is not a command. It's not an imperative. It is not a wish. It is a fact. This is what believers do. If you would hope, excuse me, if you would be a hopeful Christian, you must be a growing Christian, end quote. If you're a hoping Christian, you must by default be a growing Christian. And that's confirmed to us. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 says, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. The idea there being, if you're not growing, if you're not at least seeking to grow, something's amiss. Something's been left out. You've, you've, it says here, have forgotten your purification from your former sins. There's blindness, there's short-sightedness if growth is not a pursuit in the life of Christians. End quote, by the way, from 2 Peter 1. I recall many years ago hearing a phrase that went like this. Some Christians are so heavenly-minded, they are no earthly good. Now, that's a very quaint little quip, but I believe that quaint little quip is very misguided, and I do not agree with that premise. If we are understanding and if we are applying the scriptures properly, the most useful Christian in this earthly sphere of existence 
is going to be the one whose gaze is most fixed on heaven. The truth of the matter is the heavenly-minded individual is more earthly good. And as we fix our hope on our absolutely holy Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, and yearn to be both with Him and fully like Him in the future, our lives will be positively affected toward righteousness in the present. Remember, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthian believers, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, Paul reduced his spiritual objective to one thing. He said, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So the apostles' one consuming spiritual objective was to pursue in life what was to be the prize when he received the upward call, he said. And one of the primary aspects of the prize is Christ-likeness. The reward in the life to come, likeness to the Lord, is to be one of the pursuits of all believers in this life. We're looking forward to glorified bodies, but right now we're seeking to have purified hearts so that our our lives can reflect the image of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, excuse me, chapter 7, verse 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you and he also will bring it to pass, end quote. Now I need to say that this is not just about doing more for God. This has to do with what are we becoming? That's the issue. What are we becoming? People can be, on the outside, look like they're doing all kinds of things for God. But what is it that we are becoming? That's the issue. And this leads us into the next section. Verse 4. We're going to read verses 4 through 10. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, Jesus, is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Let's stop right there. Now, that's a mouthful right there. And admittedly, there are some perplexing elements in this section. I'm going to do my best 
to explain and to rightly divide this, this word of truth. Let's go back to verse 4. Look at that again. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So having set forth that the practice of righteousness reveals the reality of the new birth, we saw that back in chapter 2, verse 29, by contrast, John next presents the revelation inherent in the practice of sin. Since the false teachers seem to have held that knowledge was all important and that conduct didn't really matter, our text here, John, declares the reality that sin and its practice are irreconcilable with the nature of Christianity. In this section, John points out the true nature of sin, that sin is contrary to the mission and the character of Jesus Christ, and that its practice establishes the distinction, the distinctness between the two classes of humanity, the redeemed and the unredeemed. There are only two, those who are redeemed and those who are not. Well, notice in verse 4, he begins, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. The one who practices sin. This is an important word here because this portrays a class which is the opposite of those who practice righteousness. On the one hand, you have one You have one group that practices sin. On the other hand, you have another group that practices righteousness. The word for practice here means exactly what we would expect. It means exactly engaged in doing something. And in this case, it's the one who's actively engaged in doing sin. The reference is not to his being engaged in a definite act of sin, but to his characteristic practice of sinning. One writer notes that the King James translation, committeth sin, is actually misleading in that it suggests a point of action rather than the continuing practice. And that's what this is referring to, a continuing practice. John's assertion here that the one who practices sins Also, it says, practices, practices, excuse me, lawlessness, which enhances the seriousness of sin. Now, generally speaking, the term sin denotes a failure or a fault as suggesting the weakness of human nature in its failure to hit the target. Many commentators point out that sin, the, the word literally means missing the mark, and that is entirely true. But more specifically, the New Testament indicates that sin is the determination of the human nature, of human nature, in hostility to God. Sin is a deliberate deviation from and an infraction of the standard of what is right. It is a willful rebellion arising from the deliberate choice of the sinner. So by its very nature, sin has the characteristic of lawlessness. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness, the end of verse 4 says. So it is not just that sin manifests itself in disregard for God's law, but that sin in its very nature is lawlessness. Lawlessness is the essence, not the result of sin. Sin in its essence is lawlessness. 
and thus exposed in its ugly reality, the seriousness of sin here emerges. Now, we've talked about these false teachers before, these heretics. The heretics seem to have taught that to the enlightened Christian, questions of morality were a matter of indifference. And today we do the same thing with sin. Today our sins are excused by either, uh, by, by euphemisms, like you know, it's just a personality quirk, personality problem, or simply by a plea of cultural relativity. Tip, re, re, excuse me, relativity. <clears throat> well, that's relative, you know. In contrast to such underestimates of sin, John here declares that it's not just a, a, a negative failure. Sin is not just missing the mark. It's not just a deviation from what is right or just. But sin, essentially, is an active rebellion against God's known will. And it's very important to acknowledge this because the first step towards holy living is to recognize the true nature and wickedness of sin. And by the way, it's possible to have sin or lawlessness if there is no law. Sin and lawlessness were in the world between the time of Adam and Moses. Hence, even before God's law had been given. But all sin is lawlessness. Sin is insubordination to God. Sin is wanting one's own way of refusing to acknowledge the Lord as rightful sovereign. In essence, it's placing one's own will above the will of God. It is opposition to a living person who has the right to be obeyed. God has created us, and God has the right to tell us what's right and what's wrong. Verse 5 continues, And you know that he, Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Now the phrase there, the, the phrase you know, reminds the readers, reminds us, that this further fact concerning sin will be obvious to all those who have, who have experienced the truth of the gospel message concerning Christ's redemptive mission. The fact that he appeared in order to take away our sins, marks the practice of sin as contrary to Christ's mission. The plural word there, the word sins, plural, is in keeping with John's concern here with the actual practice of sin rather than just the sinful, the inful, inner sinful nature which prompts the sinful deeds. It's, it's dealing with both. Jesus came to not only address the nature that we have to sin, but every individual sin that we may commit. Christ came to take away those sins. The phrase there, take away, seems very much reminiscent of the testimony of John the Baptist. Remember when he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. We're talking about sanctification here, how the Lord deals with the sins in our hearts. The particular tense here indicates the effective removal of human sins as the goal of Christ's coming. Now, clearly the removal of sins is grounded in the atonement of Christ, His sacrifice on the cross, but the stress here is on the effect of of Christ's appearing on human conduct. Jesus didn't just come to wipe away sins in theory and the people who receive that go on living in sin. Jesus came to deal with the sin problem in our hearts. And so the elimination of the practice of sin from the lives of Christ's followers now reveals the effectiveness of His mission. For a professed believer to persist in the practice of sins, 
reveals that he is still spiritually blind to the purpose and the work of Christ, or perhaps even demonstrates that he's willfully indifferent to or maybe even rejects the demands of Christ upon his daily life. And verse 6 makes it clear what's at stake. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Now, verses 6 through 10 pretty much go together. Here in verse 6, this along with verse 9 can be very troubling if not properly understood. The words abide and the word sins are used here to designate a certain class of individual. Character is shown by one's habitual actions, not the the extraordinary ones, but the habitual actions. The tense of the verbs here are what we call there in the present. So the kind of action we're talking about here is continuous, it's habitual. Thus, everyone who is abiding in him, according to this, would be someone who has been regenerated. We're talking about the born-again individual. And everyone who is sinning, in this case, we're talking about habitual sin, is an unregenerate person. A Christian, as a habit of life, is abiding in fellowship with the Lord Jesus. Sin may at times enter his life, but sin is the exception, not the rule of his life. The unsaved person, as a habit of life, sins continuously. The word sins here is in the present tense. Continuous action is what is being indicated here. The idea here is they cannot help themselves. It's who they are. It's what characterizes their lives. Romans 6.20 says, For when you were slaves of sin... You were free in regard to righteousness. In other words, you couldn't be righteous ever because you are free from righteousness. You're unable to be righteous because you do not have the capacity to be righteous because you're not regenerated. Your heart hasn't been changed by God. Outwardly, you may do things that people look at and say, oh, they're a very good person. But the Bible says that slaves of sin are free in regard to righteousness. They don't have the ability to be righteous, even though on the outside it looks like they are, in fact, righteous. Now, John here is not teaching the concept of sinless perfection for the born-again person. Marvin Vincent's word study book is very helpful here. John does not teach that believers do not sin, but is speaking of a character, a habit. Throughout the epistle, he deals with the ideal reality of life in God in which the love of God and sin exclude each other as light and darkness, end quote. So here, he does not deny that a Christian can sin at times. Indeed, he admits the possibility of sin in the Christian's, Christian life that we saw back in chapter 1, verse 9, and then he forbids it in chapter 2, verse 1. What John denies here is that a Christian is characterized by sin. He denies that the life of a Christian is wholly turned towards sin, <clears throat> as is the case with an unsaved person. Two different spheres of existence. He asserts in the last part of verse 6 that no one who sins has seen him or knows him. And this would be, without a doubt, an unregenerate person, an unsaved person. The verbs here, seen and knows, are in the perfect tense, implying that he has neither seen nor known God in times past with the present result that he is still 
that God is still invisible to him and God is still unknown to him. The particular word here for see means to see with discernment. In other words, spiritual eyes opened. He doesn't have that. He's not, he has not experienced that in his life. He is, as we would say, spiritually blind. He asserts, however, <clears throat> rather, <laughs> verse 7, real quick, look at that again. Little children, make sure that no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous, Christ is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. And the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Now we'll notice in verse 7, once again, we have this very tender, personal address. Little children. He appeals to their consciousness that they are members of God's family. And the warning here, make sure no one deceives you, voices John's pastoral concern for the continued safety of his readers. He appeals to them to be constantly alert to the danger from deceivers. Apparently, the reference is to the false teachers that we talked about a few weeks, weeks ago who left their assemblies, but they were aggressively seeking to mislead those who had not withdrawn with them. And he calls for constant alertness against the deceptions of these individuals who abandon the community. Remember in, in chapter 2, verse 26, the warning was against doctrinal deception. The Antichrist, we talked about that. But here, the reference is to deception concerning the moral demands of the gospel. Don't let those who are doctrinal heretics lure you into behavior that reflects their character. So to avoid deception, let them discern the moral identity of the individual making this appeal to them. And the criteria here in verse 7 for a true believer is, he says, the one who practices righteousness is righteous. Now, the present tense of that word, practices, makes clear that the test is not the performance of an occasional righteous deed, but rather the habitual practice of righteousness, which is the product of new birth. Someone who's been reborn is going to characteristically practice righteousness. Now, the practice of righteousness does not make the individual righteous, <clears throat> but it does reveal his inner nature. Righteousness is going to demonstrate itself in an individual who has the character of righteousness. In fact, what we have here is the test of Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, when Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, he says, he concludes, you will know them by their fruits, end quote. So the test here refutes any claims by the heretical teachers to be righteous because of their professed secret knowledge. We talked about that too. The Bible here insists that the moral nature of an individual's conduct is the sure evidence that his inner life conforms to the righteousness of God. And notice he adds the words here, they are righteous just as he is righteous, that is, Christ is righteous. This points out that the conduct of the true believer corresponds to the moral nature of the Christ 
to whom he is committed. The one who is born again, as one who is born again, his desire is to live a life morally consistent with the nature of the one who saved him. By default, he's going to act like the Savior who saved him. Now, the other group here is identified as well. Look at verse 8 again. The other group is also identified by conduct. The one who practices sin is of the devil. So John centers attention on the individual representative of his class who is actively engaged in doing sin, the sin of rebellion and self-will, which characterizes, he says here, the realm of the devil. Commenting on this part of the verse, one author wrote this, that this sinner makes a trade of sin. By his practice, he reveals his diabolical nature. John does not say such a one is born of the devil, but is of the devil. The word of denotes source, not of his personal existence, but of the evil which dominates his life and practice. By neglecting and rejecting the moral requirements of God's word, the sinner reveals that his priorities are rooted in the realm of the devil. As the direct opponent of God, the devil cannot be depersonalized as simply the power of evil. He, the devil, works in and through those who yield themselves to his diabolical purposes. End quote. That is true. Now notice the further comment, for the devil sins from the beginning. This explains that the practice of sin is so diabolical because, well, Satan, the devil, is its originator. Now the phrase there, from the beginning, does not mean from the beginning of his existence, but rather points back to the disaster when this magnificent created being, i.e. Lucifer, arose in self-willed rebellion against God and thus became the arch opponent of God and God's good purposes. And ever since his fall, the devil sinned. That is, he has relentlessly persevered in his evil course of sin and rebellion. And that's why the scripture says that we as Christians are to be of sober spirit and be on the alert because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. End quote. But notice here, even though we know <coughs> that Satan is constantly sowing his seed, we the Bible talks about the wiles of the devil. Verse 8 says that the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Now, the distinctive title here, the Son of God, underlies the true identity of the one who is manifested to crush the power of sin and Satan. And we sang about that just moments ago. The verb there, the word appeared, indicates his visible appearing in the incarnation. His identity marks the supernatural struggle involved in his coming, that he might destroy, it says, the works of the devil. And that's the stated purpose here. It presents Christ's redemptive mission as it relates to the devil, the great spiritual antagonist of God and mankind. And notice the plural, the word, the works. This points to the, the massive activities and achievements of the devil in leading human beings into sin and rebellion against God. All of these works have a certain 
coherence as being prompted by the personal hatred and rebellion of the devil himself. He is actively working. He is a divine being working to deceive. And the Bible says that the whole world, those outside of Christ, are deceived by him. One of the ways they don't even realize they're being deceived by him is when they don't believe in him. That's one of his greatest tools. And the verb here, to destroy, implies a decisive occurrence and seems most naturally, obviously, to refer to Christ's victory over the devil on the cross. That's where Jesus defeated him. And he defeated him by raising, by rising from the dead. Sin and death were conquered as Christ died and rose again. Now, the verb there, to destroy, does not mean to annihilate. It means the following. It means to loose, to break up, to give release, and to render powerless or inoperative. So what we have here on the cross is Christ in his victory over the devil broke the chains of sin whereby the devil had brought mankind under his domination. Jesus came and broke its power. In fact, Hebrews 2.14 says, Therefore, since the children, us, share in flesh and blood, blood, sorry, (laughs) he himself likewise, Jesus himself, likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives, end quote. So our text indicates here that those who are continuously living in sin obviously indicate that they've not seen him or know him because Jesus came to break the power of sin. The Bible declares that Satan is now a defeated foe, but a person can find release from his clutches only by personally appropriating Christ in his deliverance, by being born again, by being born of the Spirit, by being set free by the power of Christ. His power enables the individual to break free from their sins. Now, the individual Christian may be where all be, may be at different points in our walk, <clears throat> but the one thing that cannot be counterfeited is redemption. We talk about false converts. Those would be people who are not converted. They've not been born again. And that's indicated by their lives. Christians in their living and their lives demonstrate the reality of that new life to their new Savior by how they live, by how they behave by how they walk in this world. They love the commandments of the Lord. They love to walk in His Word. We struggle loving that in our lives. We wrestle with our flesh. We fight with our flesh. And yet, at the same time, we wrestle not against flesh and blood because the reality is we're we're fighting a spiritual battle. And that's what this is indicating. We are in a spiritual warfare. And this is indicating to us that the the saint, the one who is born again, desires to live as Jesus himself walked. And that really is the bottom line of this section that we're reading. Now, we haven't even gotten to verses 9 and 10 yet. I have a whole thing that I want to share about on verses 9 and 10. But beloved... The Lord has called us to walk in the power of His Son. And we can do that. As difficult as it is to walk that way, it seems, at times. The Bible says, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. You know, that sign, that rather that verse, 
is out there on our sign and really is a, is a moniker for my life because I remember spending so many months and even maybe a few years in the earlier parts of my walk trying to understand how I can be free from sin. And that's obviously something that we're fighting, Christians are fighting throughout their life, wrestling to be free from the things that bind us, that hold us, that, that enslave us. But there's one reality that, that I was fighting for something that God had already done, if that makes sense. Because the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. And it's the ability to appropriate that in my life that enables me to live that way in my life. And there's things to die to, there's no question. There, there's mortification of the flesh. <clears throat> there are things that we have to crush and get rid of and destroy in our lives. But the power to do that is the power that God gives us, that enables us to do that. And it's something that if you're born again, you do have, the Bible says. It's not something that you're reaching out <clears throat> necessarily to grasp, even though we do pray more love, more power, more of you in my life. We sing that song, and that is our prayer, but the power is there to obey, to honor God with our lives. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. If you're not in Christ, you don't have that. You're living according to the dictates of your sinful nature. You are living, as, as we just saw, you're living in the power of Satan. That's the power you're walking in. That's the person that you serve if you're not in Christ. And that is just a reality, whether you choose to accept that or not. Amen? So Lord willing, next week, we'll finish up this section and get to verses 9 and 10. Let's stand. I want to remind you what, we, what I read to you during our time of communion a couple of weeks ago. Romans 16, 20 says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. We do want to remember that, don't we? <clears throat> that the God of peace will soon crush Satan. Satan under your feet. I cannot wait to crush him under my feet and to rejoice as Jesus binds him hands and foot, hands and feet, and casts him into the lake of fire. And Lord, we glory in that work that you have accomplished for us. We glory, Lord God, that one day there will be a finality. There will be an end to all sin. There will be an end of sin and a permanent end of, to death, which will no longer exist. And death, sin, hell will be cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. And the beast and false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire where Satan will already be. Glory be to you, Lord. Glorify yourself, Lord, in our lives. Help us, Lord, to walk in the Spirit and not to fulfill the lust of our flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Lord, none of those things are from you. And we thank you for the power to walk in newness of life. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.